I'm going to open the floor uh, to questions and answers. I'd like to, uh, to start, though, with an observation. Um, when justices are uh, uh, nominated to the Supreme Court, they go through very high-profile confirmation hearings, and we've probably all tuned into those hearings. Um, and a phenomenon that strikes me during those hearings, especially recently, is the extent to which everybody who's been nominated has emphasized that um, he or she is going to pl view himself or herself as an umpire, somebody who calls balls and strikes, and emphasizes that the law is something to be looked up and applied to the facts. Now, a common theme through each of the talks today is that not only is it appropriate, but that it's necessary in deciding these sorts of cases to take account of the social background facts, not just the who did what to whom in the particular case before the court, but rather a judge or a justice's understanding about how the world works best. Um, and I just want to make that observation and see if that is something that struck any of you uh, and, and, and invite conversation about whether you agree that that is inevitable, at least in the body of cases that we're talking about. Yes, sir, in the back row. Yeah, I'd like to ask, um, oops, I don't know if we're supposed to stand or not, but I will. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Lipkak a uh, question about, about your presentation, sir. Because a number of times you said <laughs> the justices will be um, asking themselves, is it time to do a particular thing, which suggests that the Constitution sort of evolves with, with time, which I guess is a common theme here. The, but the other thing you said was that they will look at things like those three elections on uh, last Tuesday, or a week ago, Tuesday, whatever, um, and, and they'll, look, they'll take note of opinion polls that show American opinion shifting on, on this issue of, of uh, same-sex marriage. And my under, as I understand it, one of the basic purposes of having a written constitution with a difficult process of amendment was to prevent um, transit democratic majorities, much less opinion polls, from rewriting the law of the land. And I wonder if you could comment on that. And that, that really goes back to the same point about whether the Constitution is um, is, is fixed for all time and whether uh, the, the dead hand of the um, uh, of, a, of a couple of centuries ago continues uh, to govern. And that really depends on how you want to think about the Constitution. There are parts of the Constitution that for sure uh, can only have one meaning. You know, how old must, must you be to be president? But it also has phrases in it, like the ones we've been talking about this morning, equal protection of the law, the freedom of speech, which are quite abstract, right? And you need to figure out what those phrases mean. And the question that divides some of the justices on the court is whether you figure out what those phrases mean by reference to what they meant in, 17, in the 1700s, uh, or do you take account of what they mean in contemporary society. I think the uh, Harvard speech that Bill referred to tells us that David Souter's point of view on this is that you have to be informed by contemporary reality, as Patrick was saying. You have to be informed by social context. That's not a universally held view, just as Antonin Scalia would take the opposite view and say that the original meaning of that phrase is understood by the people uh, who uh, ratified it is what counts. But I don't think that's the dominant view on the court. And although at a confirmation hearing, uh, a nominee really has no choice but to make the John Roberts, I'm only an empire, umpire, uh, the Sonia Sotomayor, I'm kind of a law robot. <laughs> I, take, I take the facts, I apply the law, and I, I, I get a given result. But the fact that the court so frequently disagrees means that these abstract, open textured phrases have to be the subject of interpretation, and interpretation has to take account of context, and context almost certainly means, among other things, historical context. In the back row. Yeah. Forgive me for not standing, but in hearing your speech, Mr. Lipkeck, I take what you have said and understand we are here today because civics education is so poorly taught 
therefore, the younger generation that you said overwhelmingly feels gay, um, equal marriage for same sex versus the older generation. I read the founders who said this nation will cease to exist when it loses its Christian principles. I cannot give up my teachings, which said Sodom and Gormiah ended up dissolving because of their, I don't know what kind of behavior you call it. Therefore, while I feel that our laws have treated the homosexual and the lesbian population unfairly. I believe marriage is a Christian principle. So the law that says if you live together as a homosexual couple, and I had this where I worked with a couple who had been taxed because of the law that said joint tenancy for married couples meant you automatically inherited the house. But a gay couple who had a joint tenancy deed, the surviving member had to pay a tax. That was an unfair law in this state. I understand unfair law, but I separate what our founders said, we are a Christian nation from the law that says you must be treated equal. And, and you believe, I take it, that the Constitution enshrines that, you know, that fact that at the time of the founding we were a Christian nation and it permits us to continue to interpret the Constitution in light of Christian values, requires us to, not only permits us to, is that, it, do I take your point that, correctly? That's part of it, but my okay. point goes to we are here because we haven't remembered our history in teaching it to our population. And therefore, our population, which he said overwhelmingly endorsed same-sex marriage, does not have the same educational background to make that decision. Okay. I go to the words, those who forget history are doomed to make the same mistakes. Would anyone like to respond to that comment? I, I think the founding generation, in fact, did not, did not enshrine any particular religion in the Constitution. I think it's, look. They said those who. I have a few more things to say. Um, no one is saying that a given church has to marry a same sex couple. In the recent Second Circuit decision, the court was very clear only churches uh, can sanctify marriage. Uh, and that's, that's one realm, and that's a realm that the Constitution protects. Religious liberty is very important. But when the government is making choices, the government, many people would say, need to treat people fairly. Right here. I want to get back to the other question that was raised. It seems to me that these justices are human beings, and they live in their time. And to, to say that they can be completely objective and erase all of their knowledge of what's going on in the world, to go back and interpret something that was written 200 plus years ago is impossible. I mean, Romeo said, teach me how I should forget to think. You cannot possibly, if these people live in the world, they cannot possibly do that. Well, if I could, John, if I could sure, just Bill. comment. Um, you know, Anthony Scalia, the member of the Supreme Court who um, is often identified as having the view that you have to interpret the Constitution as those who wrote it understood it to be, um, that's a selective view that he has. He applies it to some cases, but not to all cases. I think the uniform, if I'm understanding the writing correctly, the uniform view of the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, was to allow states to have militia and the militia to have arms. 
And the scholarly writing was that is the predominant view at the time the Second Amendment was adopted. Now Scalia and others on the court say, no, that's an individual right. I think if we could wake up people from a long sleep, they would be surprised about that. So, you know, I agree completely with your comment. May I add one? your point about the words important? I was reading that, <coughs> that uh, article again, and it ends with the word infringed. The rights will not be infringed. Now, to me, you know, I did look it up in the dictionary. But that is not a precise word. There are many <laughs> interpretations of that, and in, and in our use today, we would have to end the sentence with a preposition infringed upon. <laughs> and if that were the only ambiguous word in the Constitution, <laughs> <laughs> things would be better. I'm going to extend the Q and A for just five minutes because of the uh, technological issues that we have right here on the. On Thank the you. Um, first, I just have to thank you guys. Um, that panel presentation was excellent, and each of you um, added so much to it. So I really thank you. Consistently in what each of you said, each of you um, spoke about the issue of the court interpreting from within the context of society. And that's consistent with what Justice Suda spoke about. It's inconsistent, though, with my long adored view of the court as protecting the minority from the tyranny of the majority. And I wonder if you can talk about that tension. Say a little more, <laughs> why, why must it be? I can see it could be inconsistent, but it need not be inconsistent. It need not be inconsistent, except if you're saying that the court should not be out front. Um, you mentioned um, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg feeling that perhaps we went too far with Roe versus Wade because the court should not be leading from ahead, but rather push, you know, leading from behind and, and ratifying. If that's the case, then what happens to the idea of the court as being the only non-democratically elected body and therefore the only voice for those who might be a minority in society? Well, if I could um, respond to that, but in a very particular context, um, I think in the area of the First Amendment, um, that is where you see the court very consistently looking out for the minority uh, point of view uh, that's being expressed. Um, I think we can all recall numerous cases where speech that we found very offensive was sanctioned by the court as being you know, the right of free speech and a, a protected right. Um, the, the issue that I see that you're talking about, you know, which really reflects back on At Adam's excerpt from Souter about society needing to take time to sort of catch up with something. Um, I think that's true in many respects, particularly where the rights aren't clearly enumerated in the Constitution. So uh, there's a practical reason also. Uh, it's not entirely clear why we do what the Supreme Court tells us to do. Um, you know, it doesn't have an army. It doesn't have the power of the purse. It needs to have a certain amount of institutional prestige and authority. Even after Brown, it took the South a long time to get in line. There have been Supreme Court decisions that were not followed at all. So one reason the court doesn't like to get out too far ahead of society, in addition to being members of society and having a kind of blinders on, eight, eight members of Plessy, is that they need to uh, husband their uh, institutional prestige to make sure that uh, nobody wakes up one morning and says, why should I do this? <laughs>